Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. And today we're sitting down with somebody who, who I'm going to be honest, I'm a little jealous of because I am. I am. We're, we're today. We're going to talk to the man in the world who shames me with his output. Trent Dennison, <laughs> Big Deno, as you're often known. You are a very tall person. That is an absolutely well earned nickname. It's not ironic in any way. How you doing, sir? <laughs> I'm very well, Vince. Thank you for asking me to be on the show. Very much appreciated. Uh, buddy, I'm, I'm very happy to have you here. We got to meet in person for the first time very recently as when I was down in Australia. Uh, and so you were you were great. Very, very nice. Very uh, great as a judge in the Crystal Dragon, which if you're uh, ever in the area of Australia or can make it down to CanCon, uh, Trent ran that this last year. I think you said Meg is going to run it next year, right? Yeah, that, that's what we're, we're hoping for next year. Meg's going to come back and, uh, and and bring back the old judging team of Sebastian Archer and Mark Soley. So that should be good. So that means I can enter. I haven't been able to <laughs> enter for the last couple of years. Whomever is going to judge it, here, here would be my absolute recommendation. It is one of the best miniature painting competitions I've been to. It is incredible the level of talent on display from the Australian community down there. It is great artists who are super friendly. If you're in the area next year, if you can make your way to CanCon there in Canberra, uh, you should absolutely do it. Uh, it's just, I, I was just blown away, frankly. Uh, it was mm. it was not what I was expecting because I thought, oh, it's a competition. It's sort of a very gaming focused thing. And then I walked in and I was like, oh, it's like I walked into a European competition in the middle of, uh, in the middle of, you know, Australia in the middle of nowhere, frankly, not to, to be insulting, but Canberra is not the hub of, of Australian life there, I suspect. No, it's definitely not. No, it's it's uh it's something we're really proud of actually because it did it did start the way you envisage it um uh, as a gaming convention and the first year was was just, you know, a couple of guys chucking in models from their army. So uh we've we've really um had had a great progression over the last five years to, to the point now where yeah we've got some some world class artists in you know David Colwell, Cara Nash and um it, it's it's a it's a very high standard competition. So yeah it's, and, and and very welcoming and friendly as well. So definitely 100%. come around if you're there. Yeah, everybody was so super nice. Uh I I had unfortunately overbooked my schedule and didn't get to spend as much time up there with everybody as I wanted. Something that I plan to absolutely rectify next year when I come back. So uh, but we're going to talk to Trent today about his sort of journey as an artist, because I think you have an amazing journey and an amazing story of what you where you can get when you put the work in, when you focus and, and do the kinds of things I know you and I are both a fan of with this sort of concept of deliberate practice and that kind of thing. But I want to start out at the beginning. So just look, we engage in a weird hobby. Let's, let's be <laughs> honest about that, right? We, we, we take little plastic and resin and sometimes metal, but I try to avoid that people. And we put paint on them to make them look like real people or whatever we happen to be aiming for. Artistically interpreted real people. How about that? Uh, why? How did you get into this? What, what made you first want to pick up a brush and put, put paint on a miniature? It, it is such a bizarre thing to do, isn't it? It um, is. <laughs> yeah, look, I actually started a very, very long time ago. Um, I've always been really enthusiastic about fantasy genre you know like I, I was reading a lot of books when i was younger and you know my favorite movie was when i was a kid was willow i don't know if you remember that movie Mad uh, do i remember willow <laughs> the best movie i love you sorsha i don't love sorsha she kicked me in the face exactly yes so so uh but there used to be a little shop and i'm pretty close to my house called dragon's keep and i walked in there for the first time and i was just blown away there was you know walls of of advanced dungeons and dragons second edition books there was a Dungeons and Dragons arcade game, and there was this little little shelf at the back that had a game called Warhammer. So, the first thing I ever bought was a packet of Flock, uh, static <laughs> grass. Okay. Yep. And uh, and a box of Empire Halberdiers, little plastic guys that are all standing in the same thing like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where it started a long time ago. So, over over the years, I got more and more involved and uh, started participating in tournaments. I actually worked for Games Workshop for three years um, here in Australia. Uh, ended up uh, meeting probably all of my all of my friends, my best friends that I have now, through through this hobby, um, and that culminated in a couple of European trips where I was uh, participating in the uh, uh, it's called the ETC, the European yeah, Team sure. Championship, sure. Uh, for Warhammer. Even though we're Australian, we're not really European, but we, we managed to weasel our way in. I always just assumed uh, it was kind of <laughs> kind of the that you were inducted in by being you know under the crown for so long, right? Like you just got the, yeah, yeah yeah 
part of exactly. The so yeah, I went, I went there for quite a few years, and um, I then moved into War Machine, and uh, and sort of had similar similar experiences where we went on, you know, trips to the World Team Championship and uh, represented Australia and all, all all this amazing stuff. And the whole time through that experience, uh, it was always for me a, a hobby about um, painting. You know, like as much as I love the gaming, as much as I got quite good at it, it was always about painting for me. And I used to say that to everyone and they used to laugh. But, you know, that, that was the, the way that I um, relaxed, the way that I, uh, you know, use my spare time, I'd come home and I'd paint little toy soldiers. <laughs> right, so, right. No, absolutely. This is, I mean, I think uh, you cannot underestimate the value of this as therapy or as mm. just sort of... It, it's a sort of Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance type of thing, right? Um, what it's it's very centering and focusing. It does all these good things in your head. I know for me, I don't feel as uh, I don't feel as calm or as happy if I don't sit down and paint for a couple hours a day, right? Like it's yep. just, it's part of the routine. Spot on. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, probably probably about three three years ago now, um, I took a class with Meg Maples. It was a it was a a beginner's class and obviously I've been painting for a long long time but I was mostly gaming standard tabletop sort of standard stuff and, sure. and um that really opened my eyes to what um what I actually enjoyed about the hobby which was painting and and how much further I could push that so I, I took a step back from the gaming side of things and decided that I'd focus my energy and efforts on on painting um and that was sort of the start of of the last three-year journey where I've really pushed myself to become a better display painter. And uh, and that's sort of where we are now. Nice. So here's my question. Do you still have any of those Empire Halberdiers? <laughs> <laughs> no, they they uh, are long gone, I'm afraid. I actually went uh, had a pretty consistent rhythm of I would paint an army and then I would flip it, make a profit usually, and buy a new army. And then I would paint another army and then I would flip it. And that process would continue. Uh, to the point where, you know, I, I think I pretty much funded every army I ever bought with the previous army. Right. Um, so, yeah, I actually have, have no gaming models left. I did have an uh, Age of Sigmar army probably about 12 months ago that I painted, which was a Nurgle army, which was heaps of fun. Um, but I sold them and I haven't uh, got any gaming pieces left except for one Guild Ball team. Wow. So nothing. You didn't, didn't keep any of it around just as a, a nostalgia piece. No, I, 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 as much as I love nostalgia and I, I truly, I, you know, I love thinking about <laughs> the stuff that, that used to fire my imagination. Sure. Uh, I'm also very practical. Uh, that shit just sits in a cupboard. That <laughs> stuff just sits in a cupboard. So, you know, it's not, it's not getting used. Why not let someone else use it and get some value out of it? So. That's, uh, that's wonderfully emotionally healthy and adult of you, something that I, I would aspire to. But uh, let's be honest, I think I have 13 uh, <laughs> armies right now painted, so clearly I'm failing in every way, but that's all right. So, right, so, so that's a good transition uh, along. Like, I, I see how that's going. When you were painting for the game, you enjoyed it. Did you find yourself, and so this is something I really want to dig in on, because this is, we're, we're going to get to this later when you sort of make that transition. And it's funny too, because Meg and looking at Meg's work, I hadn't met her until January, but she was always such a huge inspiration for me in a mm. lot of ways. Like fall, I followed her blog very early on when I decided I wanted to, to uh, you know, sort of up my painting. I was just so fascinated by the stuff that she did and the way she painted. And I just, I loved everything about it. So very, very kin there, but. You painted a lot of armies. Hmm. Over how many years was that that you were doing that gaming? Let's say of of you know Warhammer and War Machine. I'm th I'm 36 now, and uh, I started really seriously gaming in probably about 2003, 2004. Okay, so probably most of the 15 years, I would say I was I was painting armies consistently. Okay, cool. Not playing anything now, right? You're 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 just doing the the painting side now. And here's my question: Over that 15 years, when you were just painting, it was still happy. You enjoyed it. You weren't painting, as I call it, angrily, right? Where somebody's just like, "God, got to get this stupid thing painted because it's got to go to a table." You were enjoying yourself. How much yeah. do you feel you advanced in your actual painting over that time period? Uh, not at all. 
I mean, th th there was so there's two there's two sides of any skill, which is which is the the knowledge and the understanding part, and then there's the technical part. So t technically, my my ability to control where a brush goes and my understanding of you know the dilution of paints and all that sort of stuff that progressed because obviously that's just about repetition and, and practice. Right. But in terms of my knowledge and my ability to really understand what I was doing, that never progressed at all. It was basically just I'm going to paint an army in these colors, and I did. There was there was no there was no in depth understanding of why I was choosing specific colors or what was happening or anything like that. So, um, skill wise, some progression, but but knowledge wise, no progression. Yeah, I, and that's the reason I, I thought that would be your answer, and I really wanted to drill in on that because to me, it's one of those things I always try to hammer home with people, right? Because they one of the common refrains is, "Oh, well, I want to be better," and then everybody just jumps in and says oh, we'll just paint more or just practice more and stuff like that. Now, well, you can paint a lot and not get any better. You can do something a lot and not improve at it, right? Mm -hmm. To me, there's a difference between that deliberate practice. And it's so fascinating because you had this flashpoint sort of moment, right? Where you said, I'm going to stop just doing the same thing over and over again. And I'm going to actually focus on taking those steps. Yep. Uh, insanity is uh, repeating the same task over and over and expecting different results. Right. So um, f when you make a conscious choice to say, I, I would like to improve at something, um, I think that's the first step. So uh, what, be being able to recognize uh, where your weaknesses are and, and, and look into those is, is, a, is a key part of um, you know, the, the stages of improving at any task. So um, without taking that conscious step into, I want to be better at this. How, how do I do that? You probably won't ever really um, improve that much. Right. Right. hundred percent. So you wrote an awesome uh, blog post, an awesome article recently on sort of the method of improvement and how you actually focus yourself to, to take those steps on your, on your hobby journey. I'll link that below because mm -hmm. I think it is just absolutely essential reading for anybody who wants to, to advance and is finding any challenge in it. Frankly, people of most any skill level, I think there's good lessons to extract there. Mm. But like, in, it, let's let's. But just to kind of give a summary here, when you made that decision and you wanted to start improving, how did you think about that? How did you attack it? What were the kind of broad strategies that you were pursuing there? Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> the probably the, the core tenant of uh, of that article was it talks about this the zone of learning. So. Very briefly, everyone that, that's doing something, a task that they're, they're good at or, or familiar with uh, sits inside the comfort zone. Most people have heard of the term comfort zone before. Um, but you don't learn anything when you're sitting in your comfort zone. Uh, you're just repeating the same sort of processes and tasks. So it's when you step outside of your comfort zone and do something that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable and it feels a little bit weird uh, that, that you're actually your brain... Uh, starts forging new pathways and, and, and understanding new concepts and things. That's called the zone of learning. Um, so th there's a third zone, which is called the panic zone, which I'll talk about in a second. But but fundamentally, it's 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 about challenging yourself. It's about constantly trying to do things that are uh, outside of what you've done before, so that your brain can can start to grow and evolve and and, and really uh, improve. Um, the, the the third zone is called the panic zone, and that's uh, if you step too far outside of your comfort zone, uh, you actually reach a, a point where your your natural instincts, your brain, uh, goes into a fight and flight response, fight or right. flight response, where um, you actually just obviously there's no life threatening danger when you're painting toy soldiers, right? So you're not going to run away from your painting. <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> but but you do uh, your brain does sort of shut down and, and tries to think about you getting out of that situation. Um, and so what you'll often find is at a painting table, you'll just be like, oh, this isn't happening how I wanted it to happen. And this isn't, you know, this isn't working. This is stupid. And you sort of throw your brushes down in disgust and walk away. So if you, if you reach too far and if you try too much, um, you don't actually learn anything at all. And so that understanding how that works and understanding that, you know, it's important to improve gradually over time taking baby steps outside of your comfort zone to, to really reach that um, improved level that you're aiming for. I think most people, 
they, they want a they want a quick solution, you know. Right. In this very digital and, and modern age where you can click your fingers and have anything on your doorstep in, in 24 hours, to have to work at something, to really have to take you know, step after step after step after day after day after day is, is, is a difficult concept for people to really embrace. No, I like that very much. And I think there's a couple things that, that that makes me think of. The first is that you have to be okay with and admit to yourself that when you step out of your comfort zone and you get into that, that area where you can learn something, that also means you have an increased chance of failure. And you have to accept that like, you will be failing when you try this stuff sometimes. And that's OK. Right. Yep. Like you will not succeed on all of this. That's why you step out. That's the comfort zone means you succeed basically ninety nine point nine percent of the time. Right. That's where we all live. I yep. normally don't fail making myself a sandwich. I'm pretty comfortable with that task. And I'll just <laughs> suddenly throw meat and cheese up in the air and I'm as a mess in the kitchen. Right. I can I can nail that task at least ninety nine out of a hundred times. At least. When was the last time you made a gourmet sandwich where you had to, you know, make a special sauce and uh, toast the bread and maybe make the bread from scratch. I bet you've never done that. Uh, I exactly. That would be stepping outside. But then there could be a panic zone if I was going to do like the the gastro whatever <laughs> stuff where you know you're the gastro science where I would be trying to do like some reduction of something and my ham is just a the gas yeah. ham that I've got to yeah. you breathe in the bubbles of ham. Like what? Yeah. No, now I'm panicked, right? Exactly. So yeah, it's it's a good point, but. You have to accept that increased chance of failure and be okay with it and, and learn from it and then go back to it again. And what by by repeatedly failing, learning, understanding, pushing, you're then slowly expanding, I think, out what becomes mm -hmm. comfortable to you, right? Definitely. The, the thing about mistakes, and, and it's, it's a very fundamental mindset shift that you have to make, is that mistakes are, are the best thing that can ever happen to you um, because without – you know, re really making a mistake, you, you don't get an opportunity to improve. It, it actually, you know, it, it highlights a, an area where you've got opportunity. Um, we, it's very, very hard to not get despondent, upset, frustrated at yourself when you do make a mistake. Um, but when you can make that mindset shift and, and just embrace it, uh, that, that's probably when you'll start to see you, your greatest progression in, in any task is, is just um, looking forward to making a mistake so that you can learn something from it right yeah 100 percent. the other thing that uh kind of occurs to me with stepping outside there and and being in the panic zone is how do you i want to i want to see how you you think about this kind of a situation a lot of times what i see because we live in a in this this digital world that is both a blessing and a curse where we're all we all get to see what everybody does and paints every day all the time right and so I see a lot of newer painters will often come in and they'll they'll be starting out and they're, you know, they're doing OK. They're doing whatever they're doing, how they came into the hobby. And then they'll be like, well, this is my eighth miniature. And I went ahead and I want to learn non-metallic metal and put some OSL on it and do this thing. And I'm da, 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 da. you can pick any 20 high level sort of applications of paint you can think of. I always hate the word technique because they're not a technique, mm. just, you know. Mm applications of, of the environment, of interpretation, of, of whatever. And then they just jump all into it and don't have sort of the fundaments, right? And it ends up being a very frustrating experience for them, right? Yep. Now, I, I respect, I find myself in a position where I'm like, well, I want to encourage that that fearlessness. Like, I love that you're so fearless that you wanted to try all of these things. That's great, right? That you're new and yet you weren't scared of this. So I don't want you to... I don't want to ever make people afraid. Mm. But at the same time, I might, I want to say that being said, slow down, right? Like you went straight from like tinkering in your basement, assembling uh, a little RC car to like going out to the backyard and trying to assemble a real rocket ship. That's going to take you to the moon. Like there are probably some steps in between there. We need to understand of the fundamental mechanical engineering. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you yeah. think about stuff like that? Yeah. It, <sighs> It's basically everyone has has a mountain to climb if they want to reach the top of a field or, or a task or whatever. And um, th there's no quick way to reach the top of that mountain. That that's that's what it is in a nutshell. Yep. If you if you you know look up at the mountain and you go, my goal is to reach the top, and that's what I'm going to do. That's absolutely great. It's awesome to have aspirations. It's awesome to want to be able to do NMMOSL, all that sort of stuff. 
but but the hard part is recognizing that to get to the top is a climb is an arduous journey of of you know stumbling and falling as you reach a, a, a tricky scree or a bit of slope where it's hard to climb and, and i think that's what people get wrong they see the top of the mountain but they don't see the journey that takes them to get there so as you said it's we, we, you want to encourage people who, who are reaching uh, for, for the top of the mountain and trying to do things and trying to better themselves. And that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's about embracing the mistakes. If you try that and you have a, you know, a really bad experience and it doesn't come out at all how you wanted, uh, if you don't take anything from that, which is probably a likely outcome, right, because it is right. a panic zone experience, um, th th there's going to be no progression. You're going to reach that point where, you know, every time you try to do something like that, you fail and it's just going to demoralize you and you're not going to have the experience to understand how you get how you get yourself out of that. So um, whilst I encourage people to have goals, uh, understand that you need to work to be able to reach those goals right. um, and, and when you should reevaluate your goals. Your, your long-term goal might be to be able to paint like one of the best painters in the world, but that's just not going to happen in a short period of time. Um, it, it has to happen over months, maybe years of, of grinding, understanding what you need to know, working at what you need to you know, do. And then eventually, if you are willing to sacrifice enough uh, time and effort, then you'll, you'll get there. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult mindset to have, you know, and, and it's probably if there's ever an appropriate use of the word talent, it probably is that. It's a talent to be able to s just really stick to something and, and work hard at it um, when, when we're so conditioned now to have things whenever you want. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like people often ask me, what's the most sort of essential thing I can learn if I want to be a better painter or display painter or competition painter or whatever? And my answer is always endurance, mm. right? Because you have to be able to keep painting and keep painting and keep working on things and failing at things and be willing to still try and push and all of that. It's there's a, there's a huge amount of endurance in that. Like if you're going to sit down and spend that number of hours on a piece, if you're going to withstand, you know, trying something new and screwing it up and having to redo the whole thing or, you know, some big portion of the thing because it just didn't come out right. And that's mm. just the way it is. You know, that's like when it's competition, you go and you take it to that point because that's what you need to do. Um, and, and being able to look and figure out where your work is going wrong and then putting in more work. Um, I think if there was a, a when you were working on your your elements piece that we're going to look at later, uh, there was a point that you were sharing as I was sort of following along on, on the socials. By the way, all the trend socials will be down below so you can follow him, see all this. The mini we have up on the screen right now is one you kind of finished recently. It's the big silver armored knight with a sword. I don't remember where he's from, but. Lim Limbo Miniatures. Uh, his name's Godfrey. Pretty cool model. There you go. There you go. Uh, so this is up on this is I have him up from your putty and paint picture upload. Uh, mm. But as I was following the the process or the progress, I should say, with your your elements piece, there was a point you came to with I think Earth, and we'll look at the painting piece later. But where you just weren't happy with sort of the color balance and the way she was working out, right? And the tones weren't and weren't earthy enough, as it were, for her place in the overall scene. So you had to go in and apply a lot more work, and you slowly adjusted the things until it balanced out. I think that's the the key, right? Being able to look at that, set it, let's go, go, I'm not just painting to be done. I'm painting to achieve something. <laughs> There's a mm. difference there, right? Yeah. So the, the the article sort of touches on this a lot more, so um, I'll try not to harp on it too much. But yeah, there's a thing called the four stages of competence. And, and one of those stages uh, is... Uh, unconscious incompetence and that's usually the stage most people start at and it's you, you basically at a point where you don't know what's wrong you don't even know something is wrong so one of the reasons I use social media a lot and post a lot of work in progress photos is it's important to get feedback and it's important to be able to recognize when something's not working and sometimes it takes an external source to really pinpoint that um, for yourself, because you, you're spending so much time very, very focused and dialed into, you know, the the, the painting that you don't see the picture. Right. So, um, you know that that project was a really 
uh, big big one for me in terms of how how I approach painting and um, you know because it was probably the longest project I've I've ever completed. Uh, there was a lot of moments where I had to put it down and go away and do something else, and uh, having a feedback loop where I could get you know really good constructive negative feedback about what was working and what wasn't working allowed me to um, uh, go back in and, and make changes that I felt were necessary. So. Yeah, it's um, uh, being able to to change and uh, embrace when something's not working is is difficult, uh, particularly if you've put many, many hours of effort into it already. But uh, the the core tenet that I come back to is that uh, I I paint because I enjoy painting and it's just a chance to paint some more. That's okay. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. Uh, So right now, uh, you're working. You're you're a you're a paint every day person, correct? Mm-hmm. Like as much yeah. or at least a, as possible. I mean, obviously, life sometimes happens, but if you can, mm-hmm. you try to sit down and paint every day. P- pretty much, yeah. Usually about three hours a day, I paint. Um, I don't have kids. I, uh, my girlfriend and I live in separate houses, which is awesome. So I can <laughs> I can just come come home and paint whenever I want. So yeah, usually about three hours a day. Um, I'm actually having a, a, a break at the moment because of. Uh, the last three months has been very intense for me. Uh, you know, I ran Crystal Dragon. I came back from from Monty, from SMC. I've had Craft World Studio staying with me and organising their classes and uh, did the elements piece. And the, and so, you know, right now I'm just like, I need to have a bit of a break from from painting and and that's totally okay. Um, when, when I feel the passion and enthusiasm come back and actually I was already, I got up this morning, I was looking at my painting desk going, oh, fuck, I want to go and do a bit of painting now. But... Um, you know, when it comes back naturally and I feel enthusiastic, I'll get back in and do it. So that uh, if, if you're ever going to truly, truly improve, you need to love it. You need to love the fact that you're painting and, and enjoy it because that's that's the only way you can you can sit there and grind and, right. and, and get, that, get that experience. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so do you... What's your what's your background of choice when you're when you're painting? Do you sit there in silence? Do you do some podcasts? Ooh. Do you have music on? What do you, what you know what what sets the tone? Uh, it's that's a good question. I have a number of things. So yeah, if there's a, if there's a particular sport on uh, that I like, uh, I have a TV in my painting room. Um, so I'll put a little I'll put some cricket on or some footy, which is something I can listen to and uh, uh, not really have to participate in, be active in, uh, or uh, TV shows that I've watched many times, you know, like Buffy or The Office or, um, you know, The Game of Thrones, something I've watched many, many times and I can just have it on in the background. Um, but sometimes I do listen to podcasts or audiobooks. Um, I, I tend to listen to audiobooks uh, all day because I, I do a lot of driving in my job. So I've usually got an audiobook on and sometimes I'll be writing a really exciting bits. So I'll come home and want to keep listening and uh, paint while I'm listening to the, the story progress. But uh, I'm not really a big music person i don't normally listen to music so it's different to a lot of people i think Well, oh, fair enough answer i mean you're mm. a fan of buffy so you're good here like this clearly as we respect one of the greatest television shows of all time if so, not the greatest yeah it's it's in the it would be in the top three like there's a couple others mm. that that might get in there and we could have it we could have a reasonable discussion amongst good faith people about whether it's like that or maybe you know next generation or something like that like there's mm. there's others in that oeuvre but certainly it's at the top so yeah so, so you where you're fitting in here. You're you're right. You're in the right place. <laughs> One of my people. I'm actually watching. I'm actually the reason why that I said that is I'm watching it right now. I'm at season four. It's it's very funny to watch it coming back from. You know, I haven't watched it probably in about two years. The number of '90s references in oh, the sure. show is just <laughs> crazy. Yeah, it's funny, funny how long they don't have cell phones in that show, and then how oh. different they have to structure it when they get yeah. cell phones in like season six. I think is the first time you see a cell phone pop up. Yeah landlines mate people calling people on landlines you remember when that was the thing constantly <laughs> constantly in that show yes so funny. there's uh. a moment in like season yeah i believe it's season five where uh where spike called this is this is just where this is going now i guess yeah. where spike calls buffy from a payphone to her landline <laughs> and i'm like what an absolutely you know just incomprehensible thing to yeah. happen right now yeah that's absolutely funny how fast the world changed there mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. uh all right so uh at any rate uh okay so is there anything that you, when you're looking around and you're getting a piece, you talked about, you know, getting that fire back. 
What's mm. inspiring you now? Like, what do you look at in the world? What happens? What inspires you to take a piece? Because doing the pieces you do, it seems like every one of them has something you're trying to achieve or something that you wanted to say with them. They are, you know, absolutely artistic interpretations of these miniatures. So where are you drawing your inspiration from now? What makes you look at a piece and go, yeah, I definitely want to do that? Uh, I, if I could probably... Um pinpoint one thing it, it would be other artists in, in the miniature field um you know I, I have a great appreciation for for classical art and uh when i was in europe you know we did a lot of museums and galleries and that sort of stuff and uh, i took a few photos for reference pieces but but the one thing that really inspires me is um is the sculptors and the artists that are out there in this community and you know some of them are just just mind-blowing um those people make me want to be better yep um, and so I, I do try to take a very considered approach to, to every piece that I paint. I, I want to have a specific, um, thing that, that I, that I learn or that, I, that I'm practicing when I, when I do a piece and, um, you know, for, for, for Godfrey here, which is on the screen, he, he was a, uh, a, a, a considered, uh, cold non-metallic metal, uh, approach. So I have a tendency to do very warm metals when I do non-metallic metal. I find that easier. So I wanted to try something very cold and have him in a cold atmosphere and see if I could pull that off. And and, and to be honest, there's a few aspects of it that I'm not really happy with. Uh, but but I'm also a big believer in when, when you when you finished something or when you've reached a point where you go, I'm I'm, I'm done with this piece. You don't need to keep pushing yourself and and hating it. You know, like. You, you can have a piece that you just put aside and say, I've learned what I wanted to learn from that and I'm going to take my learnings into the next piece. I don't need to really keep pushing that. And that's probably one of the reasons why I'll never be one of the absolute world's best painters because, you know, I think that there's an element of those guys just keep pushing and pushing and pushing until something is in their minds perfect. And and uh, there was a little hashtag that came out a few months ago which was uh, finished not perfect. Sure. Uh, which I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. I, I'm all about the experience uh, instead of the result. Gotcha. No, that makes perfect sense. Mm. Um, we'll we'll talk more when we do the lightning round questions at the end. We'll 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 dig into a little bit of that a little more. Uh, all right, cool. Well, great. So let's. How about we take a look at some of your work? I think it's time. Let's break in. We're going to, this is fun. I don't think we've ever done it exactly like this before, but you had such a clear journey you went on since we had that, since you had that, that point, uh, you know, because you had been painting throughout and then all of a sudden you, boom, this is, we're going to, we're going to focus on the painting. So this is great. So we're going to go through this in kind of, I think, order in chronological mm -hmm. order and we'll be able to actually track it. And, and I'd just love you to kind of share what you thought about the piece at the time, what you think about them now going back, how you work on it, the tools, how you work, that kind of stuff. Just, you know, talk about the pieces. So definitely easy peasy. All right, let's uh, let's begin. Then we'll bring this up. We're going to start with I think this one is the Atlantean King. So this is mm -hmm. the bust of our our uh, our underwater sea king in, in sort of a bluish turquoise armor. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this uh, piece, so, so when, when I look back and we talked about it earlier, I took a class with Meg and that was a real point where I um, uh, decided to push into display painting. So this was um, the first piece where I, I really think I had a considered uh, learned approach to what I was doing. I actually decided that I didn't want to use any white or black on this model. So there is no black or white anywhere on this model. Um, that was the first time I'd done that. Uh, I wanted to see if I could still create enough contrast, uh, and it was it was a great experience. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, this was the first year that I went to Crystal Dragon with display pieces, and this piece um, I was told by Meg later was actually in in discussion for for the judges' choice for the best in show uh, that that year, which was a really exciting and 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 motivating experience. But um, yeah, so the, the the model itself is actually uh, a cert from Scale 75, and he's um, actually a fire king. So I also went pretty much opposite. <laughs> sure, why not? And, and made him a water king. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, the blue is probably a, a trademark color of mine. I tend to do a lot of turquoise colors, and uh, it's one of my favorite colors to paint with. I really like that, that color. And the... 
the interesting thing looking back at it now, you know, my favorite thing to paint is, is skin tones. And I think that's probably the strongest part of the model is the skin tones. The blue is, uh, is lacking a lot of contrast. Uh, the, the metallics are pretty amateurish when I look back at them now, but the, the skin tone I think is, is very convincing. So, uh, it was fun. It was a fun, fun model to paint. And I'll probably say that about all five of the pieces we're going to show, but, um, yeah, I, I really uh, think that's that's sort of the starting point of where I was at when I when I started this this journey. Um, so it's good 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 one to show, I think. No, I, I like this piece a lot. I remember you sharing this back when you did. Like I remember seeing this uh, around. So I, I it's funny that I, I was unconsciously going on this whole journey with you, mm. uh, and I I really liked this piece, and I agree because skin tones are absolutely one of my favorite things to paint. They're so much fun, like because you can work basically any color you want into it and make it, you know, be interesting as a skin tone. Mm. There's just some sort of the, the nature of how it progresses. It's, it's fun to play with colors of skin tone with shades to work in age. And as you did here, one of the things I really like is he feels uh, older. He feels a bit tired, like the scar. I like the scarring on the, on, over the eye on the face. It's, it's very pronounced, but I, I like it still being that bright. I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, mm. Like it's a nice visual little cue that draws your eye up to the face, right? That extra yep. little scar is doing a lot of work to do that. Uh, as is the the beard coloration you did by, mm. by sort of graying out the center mustache and center of his, his beard. It does a lot to draw attention up. You also framed the top of the face with the same sort of gray white. So mm. interesting little tricks to, to surround the face in, in this sort of visual triangle that focuses, focuses you in on it. Mm. Yeah, the the... It's probably interesting uh, looking back at this for me now because that that was probably an unconscious thing that I did. But when I look at it now, as you just said, that there is a lot of things that that are helping to draw your eye to the face, and you know that the the value of the face is significantly higher than anything else on the piece, which is which is a good thing. Um, but there is a lot of color and 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 life in the skin, whereas the rest of it is very uh, cold and um, neutral. So again, that sort of something that was probably unconscious at the time, but but now would be something I would consider and, and, and push intentionally into it, so. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so this is where we begin our journey. So mm -hmm. next up, we have, uh, this is, and I've seen lots of people paint this bust because it is so fun. This is our old uh, shaman wizard guy, his, our, our friend of the animals. He reminds me of like mm -hmm. Radagast the Brown, basically, right? Because he has little birds and squirrels and such with him. So yeah, let's talk about this guy. Yes, this is uh, Cormac the Druid from Black Crow Miniatures, and the reason why I chose this one is because it's a good uh, uh, transition from the previous one. I think, you know, similar sort of facial features, similar sort of, um, you know, conceptually very similar. He's got one colour underneath and, and his face, but I think you can see there's an immediate improvement in terms of how much depth I put into the skin tone. Um, how much more considered I was in my approach with color choices. You know, if you see the orange down the bottom there, there's actually blue, yep. you know, um, carried into the orange, which is a, which is a contrasting color. Um, there's, there's a lot, lot more uh, focus around the face with that white being far more pronounced and much more high contrast, a um, lot more depth and, and nuance in the skin tone uh, and some little, little interesting pops of different colors around the piece. So, it's, it's a cool progression from the first one uh, to, to this one without still really, there's probably a few things I would do differently there. One of my biggest weaknesses I think as a painter is I don't really uh, take the, the real freehand fine details, you know, the stuff that really elevates a piece, uh, you know, like this guy it would be cool to have some patterns on his, on his little orange cloak there. I think that would have really improved the piece, some sort of patterning on the cloak. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely see the progression. You mentioned a lot of the elements that I was absolutely going to call out uh, right away as well. But I also, I, I just, I really want to draw everyone's attention to the the depth of the skin tone here and the difference in even the, the colors that you're using. So just to flip back to the king real quick, when we look at this and we see the color tones there in the face, and then we look at our, our druid friend here, you, the first thing that strikes me is this figure is also older, but you've actually grayed the skin somewhat. There's a mm -hmm. lot more green infusion into mm -hmm. it, right? Uh, especially if people look under the arm that's near 
uh, sort of his wood staff and here under like in, in our in our shadow colors, if the skin has a lot of reds up on top, which around his knuckles and the top of his hand and his nose, you used a lot of these complementary greens throughout sort of underneath his, his cheeks in the in the sallow cheek shadows under the shadows of the arm and stuff like that. And that's interesting for multiple reasons. One, because it's a good complement to sort of the pinky reddish ruddy tones of his, his skin which is then a nice compliment to the grayer tones of the rest of the skin. It's so much mm -hmm. less intense, but it's also great for a druid because everything in here, you worked a lot to balance out the naturalistic tones with that. So there's a lot of, of to me, this feels very druidy because the colors all feel very, nat very natural in that sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. a really good ad. I, I definitely smashed a lot of color into the skin. And I think this, that one of the, the reasons I love this figure is because the skin is so interesting. It's a sculpt by Lucas Pina, who's my favorite sculptor in the whole world. He's just unbelievable. Um, he just does these incredibly expressive faces and hands, his hands, hands are just amazing. So um, I, I probably have a tendency to over contrast in skin tones. And I think if you look at the cheekbones now, I probably wouldn't go quite as deep in that shadow now um but but yeah I, I really love how much how much color and richness there is in the skin and 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 the very natural tones that the whole piece has that it's all sort of a lot more harmonious than the last piece uh which i think is again that part of that progression and understanding how colors interact and bounce off each other and always tied together so yeah no it's great and somebody asked a question in the chat so that that i think is is a good sort of moment here to talk about a theory because they asked uh what sorts of blues did you use for this and basically there i think their question was related to like which brands and and how do you think about paint uh hmm. brands when you paint <clears throat> uh yeah actually so i have taught a little class and I, I talk about uh paints in my class and and pretty much i just i just pick colors that i like i don't have a specific range that i sort of go for i i just i like specific colors and so uh, the blues tend to be mostly Vallejo model color blues. Uh, I don't really remember the specific color in this one. Um, but uh, I, I take all of the different paint ranges and pick out colors that I like from pretty much every paint range out there. And although you have then varying finishes, you know, satin and matte finishes and, you know, sometimes even glossier finishes, um, the way that I control that is I actually do a lot of varnishing. Yep. So I use, use an airbrush. So I use the AK Interactive Ultra Matte Varnish through the airbrush. Absolutely. Mul it's multiple right. times. Yes. Yes. Mm. And that, that lets you control all of the varying sort of finishes and, and reflective surfaces to, to make them more consistent, which means it doesn't really matter what brand you use because they're all going to have the same sort of finish at the end. So I just pick colors that I like is the answer to that question. No, I like that. And I'm a big fan of varnishing throughout as well. I mean, most mm. pieces I work on, I would bet I varnish them, you know, 10 or 12 times over the life of the project, right? Depending For sure. on what's going yep. on. Because it is so easy. The AK, And I'm a huge fan of the AK Interactive Ultra Matte Varnish. It's, Unbelievable. It's so effective. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Like, it's not joking. <laughs> it's, just, it's unbelievable. I wonder how many other painters do that. Because I, I, I speak to Dave Colwell a lot, as I've said, and, and he, he doesn't varnish at all. Um, so, yeah, I wonder. I don't know. Things, it, but... it would be something I'd be interested in because I, I find it's just a way that I have to mat things out during the process so I yeah. can actually then hold it under a bunch of different lighting and make sure that exactly. it's looking like how I think it looks, right? Yeah, and, and it's sort of the, the reflectiveness of colors will often trick your eyes. You know, sometimes yeah. you'll, you'll do this transition and you'll be like, yeah, that's friggin' awesome. And then you'll you'll do the matte varnish and you'll look at it and you'll go, actually, the, the glossy, you know, switch was making the light reflect off the color and make it look stronger. And actually, it doesn't look that good. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, important process. Absolutely. I, I would be curious about that as well. It's something I'll have mm. to make sure I'm asking from now on whenever I talk to people, see what they uh what their process is. All mm. right. So we leave our, our friendly druid behind and we come to this girl. I don't I don't know, I don't remember what miniature this is, but this is the girl leaping up in the air with she has many, many swords. Uh, she does. Two swords in her hands, one under her foot. She's got all the swords she's got. Uh, and killing obviously a demon. Charlotte from Limbo Miniatures is her name. Um, she, uh, the, the Limbo Miniatures range is all pretty much sculpted by Charles Aegis, who does some unbelievable sculpts, really incredible, dynamic, fascinating sculpts. Um, and the, the Limbo Miniatures, one of the guys involved in the company is based in Australia. So, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a cool dude. His name's Vincent. Uh, so, oh, I yeah, like I've, him I've, more already. <laughs> 
I've painted quite a few of the Limbo Miniatures pieces, mostly just you know, because I like supporting um, you know, local companies and, and, and the models are super cool. So, um, yeah, this one was, was probably, uh, it's interesting, I, I picked this one because it's one of my favourite things I've done, um, for, for one, but also that there was a very clear um, idea around this and it was I wanted to practice uh, the lighting from underneath and, and OSL from, from, a, from underneath with the intent to um, do that on a future project, which you'll see next. Um, so this was a conscious practice choice around I want to understand how this works and, and really try, um, you know, developing my skill set in this, in this technique, in this, this process, so that um, when I do it on my piece that I want to take overseas to, to international competitions, I've got a, a little bit of, you know, understanding of how it should all work. So, um, yeah, I pretty much had a very clear idea of, of the core concept at the start with, with the demon head being radiating heat and uh, the rest of the colours. Are, are, my approach to things is usually very freeform. So I, I start usually with, a, with, a, with an idea in mind, mm -hmm. but I don't have any real, like I don't sit there and plan out my colours or plan out what I'm going to do. And, and that's one of the other reasons why you tend to see a lot of changes midway through projects because I go, yeah, that's not really working. I need to change that. So, you know, the, the rest of the colours on the model, I didn't really have any idea. I think I initially planned for um, the cloak to be to be a different colour, but um, I ended up going with blue. So, uh, yeah, I was really happy with the swords for, for whatever reason. I, I felt like they came out super cool. Um, I, I like the cloak. Her skin tone's really interesting, but the, the gold was a, was a bit of a, a weak point, I felt. Um, and her hair's got this really... Uh, uh, cartoony feeling, which is probably okay for the for the rest of the piece, since a lot of my stuff has that feeling anyway. But it, it doesn't. I don't think the hair is quite right um, when I look back at it now. So, gotcha. It is a very stark transition on the hair. Like it's going from mm -hmm. a very shock of of almost pure yellow all the way into like that deep red, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Too, too much contrast and, and and a very unnatural sort of looking hair. But but yeah, the, the skin tone and the swords are cool, and the the I think the 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 heat effect uh, works without being perfect. So, no, yeah. I think it's great. I, I really do. I one of the things I'm actually a biggest fan of on this is the skin tone you picked because mm. it's such a wonderful uh, purple blue skin tone, mm. Mm. Uh, which I think works nice as this sort of counter where you're you're transitioning from this warm color up into a it's a very cold lit from above, right? Yeah, and it is. You, you yeah. maintained that consistent uh lighting schema throughout there even the swords the non-metallic on them which i agree they do look very cool but they they also feel very cold because you can obviously play in all sorts of colors of blue steel you can you can warm that up if you're if you're inclined to right but you kept all of that uh very cold i i think it came mm. out nice um so yeah this is great so so here what i want to just dive into real quick is help us through your process of how this because this is a big scale mini right she's 75 is that right yeah yeah she's about 120 mil from top to bottom because of how tall you know that she's sitting up quite high so it's quite big yeah right so she's big so walk us through you know you said you kind of free form it just give me like a, a kind of high level how are you attacking a piece like this are you starting broad are you sketching in colors and then refining and what are you doing to do that like how are you you know sort of going down that road yeah, uh, if you if you ever interested in seeing my process evolve as it goes, pretty much my Instagram and Twitter, I, I post a lot of work in progress shots, so you, you'll be able to see this. But but fundamentally, I, I work on a sketch and refine sort of model. So I sketch in colors, and I and, and I'm very rough with where those colors go, and I just try to build up the concept in my mind, and then I will work uh, more softness and smoothness in the transitions and refine all of those, those sort of rough colors. But I do, I do tend to, I do tend to break away from that when I'm excited about painting something. I was actually really excited about painting a skin tone. Uh, I thought the skin was really nicely sculpted and really interesting shapes. So I, I think I did the, the whole skin tone first and um, about a quarter of the way through that, I, I, I started working in the, the under lighting on the skin mm -hmm. so it looked a little bit weird at the time because you had just the skin with this under lighting and then nothing else right <laughs> so sure. it, it didn't really look right um and then i think i went into the the uh the skull 
um, down the bottom and then started working the fabric. And the fabric was the longest um, part of the process and, and, and the trickiest to get right because the um, there's a lot of folds and you needed the light to hit the folds correctly and, uh, you know, understanding how that all needed to work was, was really challenging and fun and, and, and a cool experience. But, yeah, generally it's, it's you know, similar to most people I start – with the skin tone and, uh, you know, then work my way up through, you know, dressing the model as I go through. But I do tend to block in everything first and really get a get a, a rough idea of what the piece is going to look like. Do you find you are you, you now you're uh, like myself? I know you've integrated the airbrush pretty fully into your process. Mm. Do you find yourself to be a back and forth type of person? That is to say, do you work some with a brush, then you do some work with an airbrush, then you're back to a brush, then you airbrush again? Like, is it a fully integrated part of your process, or do you find that you, you know, do it more upfront, more at the end? Because there's a lot of different styles out there of how people treat that tool. Right? Mm. I, I love love the airbrush. Uh, I've started trying to force myself to to use it at different stages more. Um, probably around this this period of time, it, it was a it was a base coating tool, and and maybe sort of a bit of cheating around OSL to, to you know try and get a, a bit of a, a guide as to where the light's going to fall by using the, the angle of the airbrush. But but now I'm I'm really using it a lot more throughout the process, and, and very much back and forth, you know, using it to to smooth transitions, um, add add nuance to to colours and shadows, and um, really really integrating it a lot more, which again is, is a skill like anything else using an airbrush takes practice and, yep. and you know i think probably had i tried to do this 18 months ago I, I wouldn't have been able to use it the way i am now but this piece didn't have a lot of airbrushing i think i base coated the skin tone and, and used it for the for the red sort of lighting underneath and that was about it gotcha all right so then next up i think we have probably one of the pieces you were you were working that osl for uh, yes. So this is our two busts. This is, uh, I don't remember the two busts, but I love both of them. These are two absolutely incredible busts. I've seen lots of versions of, but th I've never, this is such a wonderful interpretation. This is one of my favorite pieces you've ever done because it is a great integration of these two pieces where you saw two distinct busts and said, oh, hold on. There's a broader story we can tell here by combining them together. So I love this. It also integrates the plinth in a really fun way that I like. Yeah. Yeah, this this is uh, probably the first real uh, conscious diversion from, from my normal process, which was I, I said to myself, I want to I wanna take um, a piece to Monty and to Scar Model Challenge that, that I'm really genuinely proud of. I want to really force myself to, to push I want to plan something conceptually and understand what I'm doing before I start. And I really you know, want to try and put something out there that, that, that's the best piece I've done. And um, so there, there was a few models I did in preparation for this. I, I painted a little Egyptian girl who had see-through skin, uh, see-through uh, fabric, so you could see her skin. I did Charlotte, which had the underlighting, and I did a, a few pieces with a non-human skin tone. Um, yeah, the models are from Carl Rudick Art. Uh, the angel is called Amitriel. And uh, the demon is called Id Idrisil, I think. Uh, the yeah, they're, they're two separate pieces, um, two separate busts are sold separately. It's not a, not a um, combined piece. So, but when I saw um, the angel, which which I think is one of the most phenomenal models that's been released in the last you know few years, and yeah. um, uh, again one of those models that inspired me to want to paint uh, something great. Um, she just she looked. She's incredibly sad. She's got this incredibly sad expression on her face. And when you uh, when you look at it, I just sort of started, well, what, why is she sad? And, and obviously the, the model itself is actually an angel. She's got her wings cut off. She's got her hands bound behind her in this in this uh, chained up uh, thing. And so I started questioning, well, who's chained her up and 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 where where is she? And and so the the idea sprung out of that, which is, which is that she's been obviously captured and tortured by this demon who's who's taking her down into the pits of hell so the piece is called into the depths it's just a you know, pretty wanky name but um <laughs> whatever, mate. It's art, mate. you gotta, you gotta, you, you gotta have a cool name yeah come on over, yeah. um and yeah so I, I spent a bit of time actually trying to find a, a piece that would work and and i actually didn't pick this one initially i picked another one which is a sculpt um by romaine van den bogart 
uh, which was a, another demon. He's a big fat guy and I, I couldn't find uh, the model anywhere to buy. So I, I was I was gutted and I had to had to start again. And and then I went back to Carl Rudick and I, and I saw that one and I, I started thinking about it more and, 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 you know, the snakes there, which which creates this sort of Adam and Eve style feeling, um, you know, very much about the the angel and the demon. Um, and I looked at the, sort of the angle that he was he was standing and I, I didn't think it fitted perfectly. Um, but uh, but when, when I found the right plinth and I had the angles right, you know, I felt like it, it really told an interesting story. And she's sort of turning away from him, um, and and he's uh, he he's just got this really sadistic smile on his face because he knows what he's gonna gonna do to her next. So uh, yeah, the, the story sort of w w w was what drove all of my choices around um, you know the colors and the concepts and. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I think in terms of, of the process, it, it all came together very quickly. That There was only one uh, step where I made a big fundamental change um, during the process, which was I sculpted eyes um, on the demon. Oh, <laughs> he actually nice. Has, okay. Yeah, he has big hollowed out um, sockets, the, the, the model, and I, I sculpted eyes on there. Um, eyes are very important, I think, to, to be able to see the model, the life in the model. And he had these big sockets, and I couldn't really, couldn't really visualize um, his expression and, and, and understand what he was feeling. So I, I, had, I felt like I needed eyes. Nice. But yeah. Mm. Uh, no, I love this. It's, it's one, it's a great example of the integration of the plinth into the broader piece, right? So mm. where did you, like, this looks like an old burnt piece of wood. Where, where did is, you get your old burnt piece of wood from? That is, that is exactly what it is. Yeah, I, I buy plinths from a couple of guys, um, both Australians. There's one in uh, in Brisbane called Jim's Bases, and he does really beautiful, um, immaculately polished, finished busts, uh, uh, plinths. Uh, and then there's another guy called Terran Studio who lives um, in rural New South Wales, and, and he comes out with these very interesting, rough, ragged plinths that, that, are, that are just pieces of old wood. I think it was a fence post, actually. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, but he but he takes them and he then actually um, you know polishes and, and and sands off certain edges. So if you have a look at the back of it, it's got a really nice finish on on the two back sides, but the front's got this really jagged uh, you know uh, bit hanging off. And um, I, I just I was looking for an interesting plinth for this idea. And when I put her hanging out, and if you it's not a great angle to see, but she's actually hanging out, you know, off into nothingness, right. and it just further reinforces her fragility and uh, you know vulnerability, which I think is um, is really cool. Yeah, it was, I was I was super happy with that plinth. Yeah, and the the alignment of it worked out so well here because by not only just offsetting her in the way that she is there, but also by the difference in verticality, like there's mm. a power uh, there's a power structure here. That you're exactly. communicating by having him above her. So it's clearly he's in the position of power um, yeah. by bringing her down. It also puts the snake right at her ear level. Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. the classic like whispering of the the tempter into the ear. Very biblical, right? Yeah. By having that there. So it just it it really works in this incredibly organic way that's communicating mm -hmm. a lot of subtle things that you don't you as the as the viewer might not even consciously think about. But if they were, say, on the same level. It just they would you would you would feel the dissonance, right? It wouldn't be exactly. the same way. Yeah, no, that, that there's there's a lot of stuff that you know. As I was putting it together, I, I actually twisted the the angels you know, angle around slightly to really you know reinforce the the, the feeling and, and and the snake whispering into ear and, and all that sort of stuff. It it yeah, I'm, I'm honestly I'm really proud of it. I think it's probably my best piece I've done, and uh, I was lucky enough to win uh, a silver at uh, scale model challenge in the masters category and a bronze in uh, and Monty in the masters category. So, pretty chuffed with that. Uh, absolutely, uh, well well earned for sure. And uh, you know those are those are two very 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 amazing and difficult competitions. So that is a, an incredible uh, amazing accomplishment, no doubt. Mm. Uh, here's my final question for it. Something I'm always mm. fascinated by. What, especially with underlighting with orange. What are you using for your oranges here? What oranges do you <laughs> like for this? Uh, so I use a lot of model air colors. Uh -huh. um, and, and because I find that when I'm doing that sketch, I, I want to pump a lot of contrast in. So I go up to a very high you know, white uh, value sort of color. And then I use 
the model air to glaze over the top of them. I find the model air colors have a very rich uh, pigment, rich, rich concentration of pigment. Um, so this is actually Vallejo model air fluorescent red is the name of the color. Um, and that's mixed in with a little bit of fluorescent yellow at the very highest points. Yep. Um, and the, the rest of it is mixed in with a little bit of scale 75 Antares red, um, which is a very powerful uh, saturated red color. So it's basically those three colors uh, mixed together in varying stages. Nice. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by the colors people use to get heat and, and the orange because there's so many out there to choose from. I know there's a lot of people who are fans of the various like actual fluorescents that are out mm. and about. So I'm just I'm always interested in what people use for stuff like that color because I think it's neat how much you can use different types of those bright paints like that to get cool effects. So yeah. Absolutely. All right. And then finally, uh, we come to uh, just an absolutely stunning piece. So again, when you're you're very much apparently this is your your let's combine busts together to tell a narrative phase. I think this is this is your blue yeah. period here for for you. And uh, it's interesting. I, I found myself doing that a lot for some reason, and I think it's it's uh, it's not done a lot by others. I, I really, when I see a bust, I sort of want to I want to dive into where that where that bust is, and you know what what's the situation around it, and and you know I think a lot of people try to tell that story with their painting, but for some reason I've I found myself wanting to tell it with with, with a with a background and, and you know with other models. So it's definitely an interesting diversion from from a lot of other people at the moment. Absolutely. And now, hey, the advantage is if somebody else does this, now now we're all contractually obligated to say, uh, oh yeah, it's the it's that's the big Deno style right there <laughs> of combining the busts. Yeah, that's the advantage of a first mover thing there. So there's the four yeah. elements, right? Uh, so, so walk us through this one. Cause I, uh, obviously we've got our air, earth, fire, and water. I did that in the completely wrong order that they're organized. But <laughs> I can't help myself. That's how I say them. Yeah. Uh, alphabetically Captain, as it were. Cap Captain planet for me. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, fire, wind, water, heart. Go yeah. planet. Um, uh, so this one's interesting. So, uh, again, it's a very considered approach with this piece and it's contrary to what I normally do. And the reason for that is I bought all four of these busts at Scale Model Challenge, um, which is in the middle of October. Um, and that's a fantastic event, really worthwhile visiting if you get a chance. And uh, I saw the busts be advertised before the event and I, I made them all put aside a copy for me. So I rushed in there and bought them, you know, first, first up and I was just super buzzed. But unfortunately, when, when you travel to Scale Model Challenge from Australia, um, it, it tends to uh, be as a part of a longer holiday. So I was actually on holiday for five weeks in Europe and Scale Model Challenge was at the start of that holiday and Monty was the end. So I had these these four busts sitting in my suitcase for five weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> all, I wanted to, all I wanted to do was get home and paint them the whole time. As much as it was great traveling through Europe and stuff, I was just like, man, I can't wait to paint these busts. So I started thinking about the four busts and and, and given that uh, I was really chuffed with how the angel and demon had come out, I, I sort of was trying to come up with a concept that would work for the four busts on one piece which is very ambitious. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking about uh, how I would structure them and their placement. And so there's a very considered approach to, to the placement of, of all four of these models. You know, the highest is obviously air because it's the lightest of the elements. And then next uh, highest is fire because it's sort of the next highest and then earth and then water down the bottom. So there's sort of a, a, a weightiness to, to that as well as um, having the two sort of cold, uh, elements, which is air and, and water on, on the left side, and then two warm elements, which is fire and earth on the right side. And then I also uh, created a, a color wheel uh, within the, 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 the concept. So um, you actually step through uh, green, uh, yellow, orange, red, uh, up to purple, and then, then back down through the blues and then back to green. So that there's actually a, a full cycle of the color wheel in, in there. And um, that was all stuff that I planned whilst I was basically traveling around Europe. You know, I had, I had this whole idea um, together in my head f from the start. And so when I came home to start painting them, I was absolutely just itching to get at them. Um, the base came together remarkably quickly. Um, you know, in a, in a matter of about a day, day and a half, I had the design and, and the location of all the models, you know, set out very easily 
Um, what are you building and, your bases out of? Like, what what are the tools and stuff you're using? Yeah, so the the fire model actually comes with that column that she's sort of resting on, mm -hmm. and that was the anchor point that I used actually to create the rest of the base. So okay. I anchored that down into the earth, um, and then obviously I wanted to have a little waterfall coming down into the water from the earth. So that sort of then created that those three elements, and then I I uh, used uh, railway cork railway modeling cork for the, the the column of rock on the on the left side and assorted other bits to to create the rest of it you know plants and um, right. bits from its box so mm. but the painting the painting was it was it was a journey it was a real challenge um i initially decided wanted to to start with the same basic skin tone but the the the, the real challenge with a piece like this that i've found is you want to have every element feel like its own unique element, but at the same time, I uh, use the term element there as meaning an individual component, not necessarily element right. in this context, but uh, feel separate, but at the same time, it needs to have a real sense of harmony to it. And so I thought the way that I would approach that is start with the same basic skin tone for all four of the models. So they would feel sort of consistent and then, and then use other colors and, and tie things together. And very quickly, I realized that that wasn't working um uh after painting two and a half of the models <laughs> so uh I, I ended up changing uh that concept and that's when it, when earth became uh the she hulk and and uh, water started getting some some blue and uh, and mermaid tones and and air became purple so um it, it was a it was yeah about five five and a half weeks of, of painting for all of that which is the longest project i think i've ever I've ever worked on um there's a lot of there's a lot of like uh little details in there that sort of get swallowed up by the whole um but you know each of the girls has a specific tattoo that relates to their element you know earth's got vines um uh fire's got a sun uh, water's got a, a a symbol the um a symbol for aquarius on her arm and I, I can't remember what what i did for air i think it was a cloud or something on her shoulder so yeah, there's, there's lots of um, lots of little details like that that I tried to tie in there, but um, it's a full on piece. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no doubt it is. <laughs> that's the that is the most generous conservative way you could describe this this thing. Yes, it is a full on piece. That is absolutely accurate. Uh, somebody asked, "What was the most challenging?" Uh, the question was, "What was the most challenging color?" But was, but I, I think I want to reframe that and say, was one of the four elements the most challenging to you? Like, which, because of the coloration you're trying to capture, was any one more difficult than the others to capture had the nuance the, of it? I had the most difficulty with air, um, but I do think that may have been because it was my favorite of the four models. Um, you know, I, I've also got a a pretty good handle on how to paint greens and oranges and 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 those sorts of colors warm colors but i do tend to struggle more with the cold colors um most of my greens blues and teals uh tend to tend to be warm so trying to do cold versions of that and cold skin tones on on water and air was was definitely harder um water i found was a lot easier to do because the the colors are sort of more in my wheelhouse with the greens and um just trying to take cold versions of that but but definitely um air was the most challenging trying to have the purple um not be a dominant color and, and be more lilac was challenging um the swan was a nightmare to paint uh the cloud it's very hard to paint a cloud right oh i so. hate it it is uh, like I like its presence in the piece. It's nice. It communicates that she's air. But I think if there's one thing that I would love to abolish, it's people putting uh, gaseous substances on yeah. on miniatures into plastic so form. Hard so it hard to be paint. crazy every time it yeah. shows up. <laughs> Fog, yeah, mist, smoke. I'm just like, okay, sure. Because yeah. even when you nail the colors, it still never really feels like the thing because there's just that intangible translucence to it. Right. Well, what I, what I ended up doing was just using the airbrush and, and having it feel unfinished in comparison to the rest of the piece, because the, you know, the way I paint with the airbrush, I, I use it to smooth out high contrast right. transitions. But, but here I've got this very low contrast, you know, soft, uh, sort of, sort of, um, feeling to it, which obviously works for the cloud, but it is certainly my least favorite part of that, uh, of that whole piece. Yeah. That's funny. 
uh, because I was gonna say <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing, but I love mm. this. I actually really like even that you integrated a little bit of a very subtle warmth into water, but in the direction of fire, right? Yeah. So it feels like that's actually like as though fire is so very hot and so like fire puts off light and heat. Hence, she is pushing some of her color out into the rest of the world around her. But yet water still feels very cold. I think I think water skin tone is absolutely my favorite. Those mm. like blue and green uh, undertones there, the way you captured those just are, are absolutely gorgeous to me. Like I just I love everything about her skin tone, the even down to uh, the her lips feeling, mm. but you know, being in that blue tone and her eye shadow, like the way her eyes are reflecting those lights and playing across the tones uh, of, of on her eyelids. And she has closed, mostly closed eyes. Uh, mm. I think she's absolutely great in that respect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, fire, fire is actually probably the thing that anchors the rest of the piece um, in a lot of ways because she is radiating heat th throughout the whole piece. And if you look at, uh, you know, the, the model from different angles, that there's, there's warmth coming out on, on touching on the swan and on, on the rock face, on the, the coral, you know, on, on the back of earth. There's a lot of, there's a lot of that um, warmth coming out. And I think that was sort of what allowed me to tie the, the three models or the four models together was having that one consistent thing that everything was anchored around. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something I think you should be very proud of. It's an absolutely amazing piece, amazing accomplishment. It's, it's a wonderful piece of art in the truest sense of the word. So, hmm. yeah, I, I, we actually visited, uh, in, in Florence, the, uh, um, the Uffizi and there is actually a, a room called the elements, the room of the elements. And it's, oh. it had a lot of classical, uh, artwork there, which had, um, elemental pieces of artwork, which was super cool to visit, uh, whilst I was mulling over this, um, this piece, uh, obviously I hadn't started painting yet. So, but yeah, no, I, I'm really proud of, of this piece. I, I certainly think, um, I, I feel like the other, the angel and demon is, is a better piece um, because it's, there's more time invested in the individual models, you know. Um, I reached a point with the elements where I was like, I, I just don't know that I can keep going. I could probably have spent another three months on it to, to really take the detail and, and, and the quality of the transitions and everything up another notch. But um, it, it was just an experience that, that I wanted to enjoy. Uh, you know, I wanted to feel... Like I, I was, I was um, enjoying painting these models, and I didn't want to reach a point where I, I, I wasn't. Right. So I, I, I said, I'm, I'm calling it here, and I do actually have a few little things to tweak. Um, I want to uh, do some more water effects down the bottom. I want to add some, some little lily pads and stuff, which I will do. I'm, I'm going to enter it into a small painting competition in Brisbane, which is called QMHE later on in the year, um, before I ship it off to its new owner. So nice. Absolutely gorgeous. All right, let's let's go back to you on screen here. All right. <laughs> All right. So now it's time for the lightning round questions and and audience who's watching. If you've got any questions uh, for Trent, go ahead and drop them in the comments. Uh, they'll get that in just a second. So go ahead and type those up. But first, we're going to go through uh, my lightning round questions. Some of which we've already touched on, but that's okay. Uh, we'll start at the beginning with the most challenging lightning round question ready mm -hmm. okay you you must pick one that's the rules of the game so okay. who is your your favorite miniature painter miniature painter past or present mm, uh, that's such a hard question man <laughs> i know that's the whole point it's supposed to be uh, i think i think I, if I was to be very biased and 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 uh, use my country, I would probably have said Sebastian Archer um, because I love him. But but I'm I'm gonna go. Mm, I'm probably gonna go with uh, Lan Studio. Um, he he just it, it, at this point in time, it'd either be Lan or Carol, and I think I'll go with Lan. He just his his models. You can pick them from a mile away. You just know immediately yeah. it's land. But they just have this real otherworldly quality to them. Um, he, he's not as he's not as revolutionary as Kirill, I don't think, and and, he, and he's probably not as um, you know uh, 
uh, innovative as, um, as someone like Alfonso or, or you know, as, as consistent as Masklin's, you know, but, but I think uh, that the models that have most inspired me recently ha have been pieces from, from Land Studio. So, Land. Michael, yeah, yeah, Michael, Michael Bazarski, Bazarski, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I can only wholeheartedly endorse that that kind of a choice because my God, I, the amount of time that I've used his models as inspiration or reference mm -hmm. or looked at and just marveled, you know, there was one he did recently with like a, it was the the bust of sort of the girl who's kind of in the prison like this bone or stone prison around her and just what he achieved on like the red skin tones of feeling somebody who was like in extreme heat and stuff like that it was just i just you yeah. know it, it was just like i immediately wanted to go paint a piece that used warm skin tones right and just play with what what could i i do in a similar vein he's the kind of person who just makes you want to reach and try for stuff yeah that is 100 percent correct it was lost soul by cal rudick oh there words. you go Thank you. Yeah. Your knowledge, by the way, of the sculptors and the names of pieces is beyond impressive. It is yeah. a thing I lack. I can never keep it in my head. Like I recognize the piece. I'm like, oh yeah, I know what that is. That's and I can usually say like this person painted it and this person painted it and this person painted it, but I can never remember who did them. And that's really insulting to the sculptors who are doing such amazing work. I should focus on that more. So no, full credit I, to I, you. I have I have a uh almost photographic memory in a lot of things numbers models i tend to be i tend to be able to remember pretty much everything but uh yeah anyway all good nice nice all right good answer now i think we already touched on this one uh but nonetheless we'll get it out there what's your favorite color of paint again you must pick one doesn't have to be i don't care about brand just color mm -mm -mm. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with, uh, Scorpion Green from Vallejo Model Air. Wow. It's probably my, my favorite color that I use. Uh, I tend to use a lot of greens and so it's been something I've used a lot of. It's a Model Air color, but I use, I don't use it through the airbrush generally. I use it, uh, through the brush. Nice. That is a, that is a wonderfully specific answer. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now, for this next question, you can construe the word type however you like. What mm -hmm. is your favorite type of miniatures to paint? Um, I, I could answer with, you know, I, I prefer to paint busts or I prefer to paint, you know, sure. 75 mil models. But but I actually, the thing that inspires me most and the thing I like to paint most is, is just really uh, fantasy uh, archetypical models, you know, barbarians, wizards, sure. you know, druids, knights, Be because of because of my background and you know where I started and what I get inspired by. So, so fantasy archetypes is, is what I would answer that question with. Gotcha. So basically, if you're uh, in your mind, it, like the the pieces that sort of grab you, the things you like to paint are like if you've got a Frazetta painting. Just translate it into a miniature. There you go. Bang That's, on. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Got it. Right on. All right. So let's go to a couple questions uh, from the viewers here. Uh, since you've been on this this learning journey, uh, what's the thing you've enjoyed learning the most, and what do you what do you feel you've learned that you're most satisfied with as of right now today? Um, the the most valuable thing I've learned is. Uh, the, the, the value of practice, um, without a doubt. The, um, what was the second half of the question? What, what's, what's been what my... What have you learned that's been the, that you, that you are currently the most satisfied with in your progression, that you feel you've made real progression with? Um, oh, but I, I, it's probably skin tones in general. You know, I think, uh, when I was painting skin tones as a, as a gamer, it was always uh, get a bit of the old bronze flesh out there, get a flesh wash happening, and then, you know, L flesh highlights job done. So to, to go from that to where I am now with, with skin tones and, and how much more nuance and color and, uh, you know, uh, contrast and uh, you know, cons considered approach to painting skin tones, I think that's, that's probably my, my favorite thing that I, I do now is, is paint interesting skin tones. Nice. All right. Very good. Uh, and then somebody had said, when did you decide? I think the answer is basically three years ago, but but maybe not. 
maybe it's there's kind of multiple influence inflections because as we talked about your journey but somebody said when did you decide that painting isn't just a fad but a serious thing do you think that happened multiple times in your life uh, because you know you still wanted to paint when you were gaming mm. yeah I, it's interesting i think when i first started playing you know warhammer and 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 actually necromunda was was that was the seminal gaming experience of my life i should add because that was that just loved it all right um, hold on we got we got to pause here for a second which what gang? Uh, I was I, I played Goliath, but I think my favorite gang is Escher. Escher gangs. Go. All right, um, you you have given the correct answer in Escher. You may now continue. Please continue. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that that experience, man. When I was, we, we just used to play every weekend, and you know, just I think the progression, the experience, you know, the, the side of it, watching these little stories unfold, it just made a fired my imagination like nothing else. And I never got the same feeling out of Mordheim, but but it certainly drove me into Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, all, all those sorts of things. But um, to go back to your question, uh, I uh, realized I love painting very early on in, in that um, gaming journey. You know, I, I would I would paint armies and, and models more than my friends because I just wanted to paint. So, you know, pr probably as early on as when I first started in the hobby was when I felt that. But there's been periods in my life where I haven't. Um, and it's only really probably been in the last four or five years where, where I've started to value that um, as as a as a release, as a you know a time for for my brain to you know work through some of the things and the challenges that I have in my life. You know, just just a real a real moment for me to to almost yoga like. Yeah, yeah. Zen like experience. Um, so it's it's yeah, probably probably four or five years ago when I um really started to value and appreciate what it was. Nice. Nice. Uh so another question here from the viewer. Have you ever had a big aha moment when discovering how to correct a flaw in a technique or application or, or something like that, or you were trying something and just something clicked? Can you think of any moment where when you were trying something it just you were like, that's okay, I, I got that that worked. Yeah, I can actually. Uh, I've got a perfect one and it was in Meg's class. Um so we talk uh, we 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 talked a lot about highlighting and stuff and I I was obviously relatively advanced in terms of my technique and my capabilities when I was in Meg's class, but I wasn't understanding the concept and uh, I painted this orc arm and uh, I I did the highlight which is which is a common mistake that painters make. So the lighting on the model was coming from the top down. Mm -hmm. But I did the highlight uh, here because when I was looking at it, this was the highest raised area of the elk's arm. So instead of the light being here from the top down, mm -hmm. I was highlighting from here. And when she pointed it out, I had a fundamental shift in how I thought about uh, uh, where to highlight and, and how volumes interact. So that, that um, was a huge learning experience and i think from there that that may have even been the moment where i was like well i think i really want to get into display painting more because that's a huge a huge thing um so that was it that was a big moment i actually read a book from uh, a guy called jeremy abonnement taboul uh called figopedia which uh, which was reading through that book was another huge expanding of my brain and, and and how i approach miniature painting so that sort of talks about that concept a lot more as well Nice. Yes, I know that a lot of people recommend that book. There's another one. Um, what is it? I can't think of it off the top of my head. See, because this is why I'm bad. My brain, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, Color and light or, or whatever, right? Another yep. big one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, there we go. That's it. We're at the end. So awesome. uh, everybody out there, thank you very much for watching. As I said, make sure you look down below. In the description, you're going to see all of Trent's socials. You can follow him, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, his blog will be down there. Go and read that article. I really can't recommend it enough. If you are anyone who's wanting to uh, improve uh, or take steps on your hobby journey, you know that's a, a big part of what uh, I'm all about is trying to, to help people take their next steps. And I think Trent's article is such a great, great, great distillation of so many core concepts that people should be employing. So I really can't recommend you to go check that out enough. Uh, if you're watching this and you liked the interview, go ahead and hit that little like button over there. It's right there. There it is. It's down. It's down there. Go ahead and hit that. It's very much appreciated because it helps other people find uh, this interview with this great artist. It helps other people find Trent. 
Uh, so we really appreciate that when you hit that little like button and or and or subscribe as always. Uh, but as for that, Trent, thank you very much, sir. Appreciate your time today. It's been great. Thanks for joining me on an early Saturday morning. My pleasure, mate. It's been it's been great, and, and uh, just personally, it, it's really a real privilege to have you come down to Australia and you know be, be a part of our our little community. We, we, we're very isolated, and and it's it uh, means a lot when we have painters come and and you know be a part of our community. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll see you again next year. I am fully planning on it. So barring barring anything unusual happening, you'll see me floating around, and hopefully this time with a better schedule. <laughs> Uh, good. <laughs> so for all of you out there watching, thank you very much. Always appreciate it. We'll see you next time.